Amen. <laughs> All of us have a talent, we should use it. Again, let me say that I am glad to be here this morning. Uh, I have to make a couple of statements that, so that I don't get in trouble. <laughs> One is I have a tendency to be long-winded, so I will try to abide by the time limit uh, and stay as and move as quickly as possible. Uh, I spent the last two, three weeks in study, and I had on my desk three different issues that I were dealing with, and so I had to come to the conclusion of one and finish it in order to use it for this morning, and that's what I've done. What I want to talk, speak to you this morning on is the subject of the God of the Bible. The only proper attitude for the study of God is based on and modeled by a directed and directed towards a sincere, deep desire to know the truth about God. I happened to look this morning, uh, because I'm going to preach at the rescue mission this month, um, from the book of 2 Peter chapter 1. And I happened to be reading and noticed that Peter's emphasis in the book is this same idea, a knowing God, knowing the God that you serve. Lehman Strauss wrote, and he said, Man should know the knowable because of the rise of the new conception about God which contradicts the true conception of God. And you don't have to go very far or to be very, very much in the world to realize that there is a grave misconception today about God. People have all these wild and weird ideas about the God of the Bible. A.W. Tozer wrote in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, and if you've never read the book, I'd encourage you to do so. It's just a small one, but he said this, I like Tozer, I think he's one of, the best, he's my, one of my favorite preachers of the past. He said, the history of mankind will probably show that no people has ever risen above its religion, and man's spirituality, spiritual history, will positively demonstrate that no religion has ever been greater than its idea about God. So God is, the subject of God is very, very important as far as scripture is concerned. He goes on to say that a right conception of God is basic not only to systematic theology, but to practical Christian living. So it's very important that we understand and we have a good understanding and a good picture of the God of the Bible. Strauss writes and he says a study of the gospel narratives on the teachings of Jesus about God shows no sustained argument for his existence. Jesus didn't, didn't try to prove that God was alive. He assumed his existence in all of his discourses when referring to God. He, Jesus spoke of God as an eternal, conscious being. Moreover, he taught clearly that God is knowable, saying, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God. So, people say, well, you can't know God. Well, the Bible makes it clear, and Jesus did in his lifetime, that you can. And that that's what we need, is a true and factual knowledge of who God is and what he represents. Ignorance concerning God has had the telling effect upon mankind. Who can say without fear of contradiction that the life, that the ills of the human race are not traceable to the wrong ideas about God? And there are many of them. Tozer again said, he said, we've been snared in the coils of spurious logic which insists that if we have found him, we don't need to seek him anymore. And some people have that idea. That if they become a Christian, they don't need to know any, they don't need to do any more searching or look or understanding about God Himself. He goes on to say, he said, we can never know who, and I like this phrase, and I think it's an important phrase. We can never who know who or what or we are until we know at least something of what God is. Let me say it again. We can never know who or what we are till we know at least something about what God is. We can't understand ourselves until we understand who God is. We have to have that basic understanding in our own lives. To most people, God is an interference, not a reality. He is a deduction from evidence which they consider adequate, but he remains personally unknown to many. They have a vague idea, but they, they consider God to be someone that's a distance and that they can't get to. But the Bible teaches God is the sovereign ruler over all the universe. Tozer went on to say, he said, a loving personality dominates the Bible, walking among the trees of the garden and breathing fragrance over every scene. God is so vastly wonderful, so utterly, completely delightful that he can, without anything other than himself, meet and overflow the deepest demands of our total nature. He can meet every demand that we have in our lives as far as that's concerned. 
You see, without a complete understanding of this, we will never have a solid foundation for understanding what comes next. If we don't have a clear understanding of God, we won't understand what's coming next. We cannot grasp it. A lot of it has to do with how we proclaim the gospel. I served for five years in a ministry called Child Evangelism Fellowship in West Virginia as a local director. And there's a lot of things that since that time, that's been 20 some years ago now, since that time that I don't agree with what they did or they practiced. But there's one thing that they did do, and as I started studying about this some time back, it came to my mind. The one thing that they did do, that when we went to, to lead children to Christ, they began with God. Many, many today, their gospel truth presentation begins with Jesus Christ. And how can someone understand who Christ is if they don't know who God is? How can they understand the importance of what Christ did without knowing God? But that's the one factor that I thought was very interesting with them, is that they did. When we began to, to give the gospel to children, we began with the subject of God, who He was and what He did. And I think that's, that's our starting point. And anything that we're going to do as far as in salvation or as far as in any type of ministry, we have to start there with God. We have to make sure that we know what God says about it and what God thinks about the things that we're talking about. You see, a lot of us, it has to do with how we proclaim the gospel today. Our first introduction to the faith is through the proclamation of the gospel message. We begin with Christ. But often, but often God's sovereignty is not a part of that message. God is the one who is in control. God is not presented as the king, the sovereign ruler of all things. You see, the world is perishing for lack of knowledge, and the church is famishing for want of his presence. There is no desire for God. There's no seeking of God. It's interesting that the Bible said in Romans chapter 3, and Paul's explanation there of men and their lost condition, he said that men outside of Christ do not desire nor do they seek Him. Jesus said in His own lifetime, He said men won't come to Him because they are in darkness. And they're, sin, they're, they're, they're in darkness and they can hide their sin in darkness and so they have no desire to come to Him. But you and I must know the truth of what God has done to save us. We must know God before we can appreciate His work. If we don't know Him, we can't appreciate what He has done. And many times that's the reason people take salvation so lightly. Because they don't realize the cost that was involved. They don't realize the price that God paid in order to forgive us and to redeem us from our sins. He paid a tremendous price. He gave His only Son to die for you and I. Imagine if someone came to you and you had to decide if your child was guilty of something. Would you do the same for him or her? Would you put yourself in her place or his place? In order to atone for the problem or the sin that had committed, that's what God did. He gave His only Son for you and I. You see, a right conception of God is basic to practical Christianity, Christian living. It is to worship what the foundation is to the temple. Now, this morning what I want us to do is to look at only three. There are many more, and I would have made many more, but my wife said, you better not do that because you won't finish. Well, I probably won't finish anyway, but there are, I want us to look at three characteristics of God this morning. And I gave you these quotes and things because I think it lays a foundation of the importance of the subject of God. Because we're talking about the God of the Bible. We're not talking about the God that the world talks about or that some in the church talk about because that God is an alien and a strange God in relate when he's compared to the Scripture. It's not the same God. But we're going to talk about the God of the Bible. And I'm going to give you three characteristics. Hopefully I get through all of them. If I don't, that's fine. But the first one is found in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 25 to 26. Now, I wrote, typed these verses out so I could read them probably faster than you'll find them. But the first characteristic we find in that text that I'm going to read is that he is unique. That God is unique. Listen to what Isaiah said. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host by one by one and calls them each by name. Because of his great power and might, strength, not one of them is missing. In this text, we see that God 
is unique. Now, uniqueness is defined as one of a kind like no other. And that's the God that we serve. He's one of a kind. He's like no other God there is. God is unique in that He is totally other of His creation. Totally different from His creation. Totally different. His nature is different than ours or anything created, any created being. God cannot be compared to anyone or anything, for He is unique, alone as a creator of all things. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 10, verses 6 and 7, He said, No one is like you, O Lord. You are great. Your name is mighty power. Who should not revere you, O King of the nations? This is, due, this is your due. Among all the wise men of the nations, in all the kingdoms, there is not one like you. That's Jeremiah's description of God. He's unique. He's one of a kind. There is no other gods like you. You see, these statements found in Jeremiah, they're statements of uniqueness. He says God is unique. God's uniqueness results in men owing Him their reverence and their worship. His great power calls all men to bow down to worship Him. The fact that God would even deal with men is an amazing thing within itself. Would you agree? Yeah. The fact that He would even bother with you and I is an amazing thing within itself. You see, it, this is the predominant theme in Psalms chapter 113 in verses 3, 5, and 6, where the psalmist wrote, he said, Who is like the Lord God, the one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the, look on the heavens and the earth? I found that to be an interesting statement. He stoops down to look at you and I. Sometimes we have the idea that we're on the same plane as God is, but we're far from being on the same level as He is. The psalmist said that He sits enthroned on high and He stoops down. He looks down to see you and I in His creation and His creatures. Like a man stooping down to look at a small creature crawling on the ground. So God looks down upon all, upon all of creation itself. The words in Isaiah 40, verses 12 to 18 should cause us to bow down in adoration. Listen to what Isaiah said. He said, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Now, let me, let me share with you, because this verse is amazing. This is an amazing verse. The hollow of your hand, from what I've been told, is from your thumb to here. Just like that. Now listen to what he said. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth, listen, in a basket? The dust of the earth in a basket. Or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Who has understood the mind of the Lord or instructed him as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? Who, who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? Surely the nations are like a drop in the bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Lebanon is not sufficient for altar fires, nor is animals enough for burnt offering. Before him all the nations are as nothing. They are regarded, they, they are regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. Who to whom then will you compare will you compare God to? There's no one else. Everyone falls short. Every other God that men have made today doesn't match, doesn't come up to standard. You see, we cannot compare God to anyone or to anything. He's beyond our capacity to even describe, much less comprehend. Amen? Amen. To just try to describe Him is very, very difficult. If you read what Isaiah said, it's mind-boggling. He weighs the dust of the earth in a bucket. He can measure the ocean in the pond, the hollow of his hand. There's nobody else that can do it. That's mind blowing when you see that. I remember the first time I found these, we saw these passages. My wife and I, several years ago, was watching a video, a DVD series on the sovereignty of God. And this guy was going through these verses, and we had to stop the DVD because I've been in church since I was a kid, and I never, never read or seen this. And I, we stopped the DVD to look the verses up to make sure that he was telling the truth of what he said. But it was amazing because you can not only hear, but you can go through the scripture, all the way through the scripture. And you can find these revelations of God, the God that, of the Bible. And you'll find that when you start reading those, 
you find that my knowledge and your knowledge of him was really, really small. Yes. Really, really small. We don't have a good grasp on who he is. You see, he is beyond our capacity to describe and even comprehend. It is our nature as sinful rebels against God to recreate him in our own image. That's what many do. They create him in their own image. They make him what they want him to be. We try to place him, we place him on human characteristics and motivations. We want, God, we want a God that's more like us, susceptible to our failures and our problems. But the God of the Bible is unique. He's like no other. He's like no other, including you and I. You, you and I cannot stand shoulder to shoulder with him. We don't compare. We don't match up. It just doesn't happen. He is truly unique. Number two, not only is he unique, the Bible, the, the God of the Bible is unique, but he is eternal. Eternal. One of the most difficult things for you and I to understand about God is His eternal nature. You see, you and I are limited in time. We experience reality as a series of events, past, present, and future. That's how we experience. We deal with past, the past, the present, and the future. We think in temporal time-based ways. One of the greatest ways God is unique is seen in His relationship with time itself. What does it mean that when we speak of God as eternal? Here's what it means. It simply means, it, simp it is simply asserting that God has always existed and will always exist. He didn't have a beginning and he'll never have an ending. He is, he is the beginning and he's the ending. In Revelation, John said he's the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. So one of the greatest ways that he is unique is that he has no beginning. He has no ending. Jesus taught, in the, in the beginning, the Bible says in the beginning, God created the earth in Genesis. God was there when it began. This tells us all that space, matter, and energy, and time had a beginning, but that God was before all of these things. So before you get to Genesis chapter 1, you find that the only, th the only living thing that was around was God. He was it. It was because of what he did that we have what we have today. It is because of what he did that you and I are here today. So God is eternal. He's always been. It didn't, there wasn't a day when God came, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. That wasn't the beginning of God. God had existed long before then, before Christ had came. Everything marked by time must have a beginning and may have an end. As created beings, we have no guarantees that we will exist endlessly in human bodies. We all know, because the Bible says it's pointed unto us to what? Die. So there's a point where we're not going to exist anymore. But God will continue on. He continue, he's eternal. Before there was life anywhere, God existed as the very essence of life. Jesus taught the Father hath life in himself. He giveth to all life and breath and all things. It is because of the life of the Father that you and I can have life. Remember in Genesis chapter 3, when God created man, what does the Bible say that he did? The only thing that God put in man when he, put, when he created him was this. He said that he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That's what God placed in man when he created him. It's his breath that, he, that we have. It's his breath that, it, we, that causes us to live. You see, all of the life for, depends upon him. For existence. You and I depend upon Him. If we, if we try to annihilate, we try to say that God doesn't exist, then we've got a problem. Then we have, to, we have to answer the question, then how is it that we exist? How is it that we can sustain ourselves and sustain the universe if there's not some eternal being that's in control? We can't. And it makes a lot more sense and it's a lot easier, at least for me, to believe that God's eternal, God's always been, than to believe that that he's not, or to believe that there are different gods that make up all of this, because that's just hard to believe. There'd be no, no coordination to it. If God is limited to an existence within time, then we have to believe that time itself existed prior to God. So if we believe that God only came into being in Genesis chapter 1, then that means that time existed before God did. Can't happen. There was, no, there was no time before God. 
It was when God came on the scene that time began. So we have to understand that when we talk about God. Is time, is time an absolute? Is time an absolute that is higher than God? No. No, it's not. Is God sub subservient to time? No. Time makes no difference to Him. And I'll show you something, something that's very interesting. Or is time itself a creation of God defined and directed by Him? Yes. That's the true answer. You see, the Bible teaches God is the creator of all things, including time itself. He created time. Therefore, He is not bound to an existence that is marked by the past, the present, or the future. He's not bound by that. He operates outside of those lines. Isaiah wrote, Who has done this and carried through, calling forth generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, with the first of them and with the last of them, I am He. Isaiah very clearly said, It is God who brought it all about. Notice in the verse, he said, Verse, God is with the first and the last. God was there at the beginning, and God's going to be there at the end. Amen? Amen. There's not going to be a, there's not no, no stopping point. He's not limited to these generations, but is there. But is their creator, the one who orders them, determines what will come about in them. The psalmist wrote, Before the mountains were born, and you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you're God. The psalmist again emphasizes the fact that God was there before the world ever came into existence. God's existence cannot be defined by time. God transcends the boundaries of time. At the burning bush, God said to Moses, question, Mo, God said to Moses, question, He said, When I come unto the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said this, Thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me. What did God mean when he said that? He wanted to be known by his name. I am. I am. Levin Strauss says, he said, in the, in the divine vocabulary, there is no past or future tense. With God, there is no was or will be, but always the now, the present. As I thought about this last week when I was working at work, I thought, God is not a God of the past. He's not a God of the future. He's a God of the now. Right now. Now is all that there is as far as he's concerned. There is no past. There is no present, no future. It's now. God lives in the now, and that's where you and I should live. Is in the now. When we start trying to live in the, when we live in the past, we get in trouble. When we live in the future, we get in even more trouble. The God that you and I serve is the God of the now. He knows what's going on now. He knows what's, what what we need in our lives now. He doesn't have to think about. It. He don't have to wait till something happens before he knows what to do about it. He already knows. Isn't that great? The Bible says God knows your needs, but He knows what we need before we even ask Him. He's a God of the now, the present tense. He doesn't need to wait on time. He doesn't need to look back to figure out something. He knows it right now. Now, to many of us, that's, that's mind-blowing. That's hard to comprehend, to think of a being that, that knows, He knows my thoughts before I even think them. He knows the words that I'll say before I ever say them. Amen? That's the God we serve. He knows what we'll do in the next five, ten minutes. He knows what we'll do when we leave here. Nothing that you and I can say or do can surprise or take God off guard. Right? right. There's nothing we can do or say to take Him off guard. He always knows. When He testified to His own, God testified to His own eternalness. He said, before Abraham was, I am. Claimed eternalism. Notice, because the Bible says he took up the they took up stones to stone him. Why? When Jesus said that in the garden, when they asked him and he said that, they knew what he was talking about. They knew what he was professing to. He was claiming to be God. He said, they asked him what his name. He said, I am. The Jews knew from the Old Testament that that was the God of Israel, the God of I am. They took offense that Jesus claimed to be that. And the Bible says they took up stones to stone him. 
They were going to kill him because of that. And that's basically, when you study the crucifix and the death of Christ, that's basically why they put him to death. They put him to death because of his claim to be God. They didn't mind the miracles. They didn't mind the other stuff, the preaching and teaching. They could get, a, they could get along with that and, do, and be all right. But it's when he began to declare himself to be God that they had a serious problem. They had a serious problem. And that's when the Bible said that all of the religious groups joined together and began to consort as to how they could get rid of him because of who he claimed to be. He claimed to be God. The psalmist said, Before the mountains were brought forth, forever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from the everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. In Psalms 90, we have a contrast between God and man. God is seen to be eternal, while man is frail and finite. Verse 2 reminds us that before ever God gave birth to the earth and the universe and brought the ancient mountains into existence, He was there as a pre-existent pre one. If God does exist this way, then it follows that all points in time are instantaneous to God. They're all instantaneous to right now. He doesn't have to wait. It's now. If God is not experiencing as necessarily a progression of events, then all points and times are now to God. He is constantly the I am because there is no past, there is no future, and there and to the being of God. He has no past, he has no future. He's now. And that, that is somewhat exciting to think about. And that's why I, I like the quote that I gave you earlier that Tozer said. That if we don't, and I'm, and I'm afraid, and I'm not being negative, but I am afraid that many do not have a right concept of the God of the Bible. Or they have a concept of a God. But what about the Bible, God of the Bible? You see, because we have some, many times we try to make, we try to think that God is like us that he acts and, and operates in the same manner in which we do. He doesn't. He doesn't. And so we need this basic understanding of who he is. God's knowledge of the future and his base is not upon predictive powers, but upon the fact that God created time and is always present in that future that exists, exits solely because he decreed it be. So God is not only unique, but the Bible says he's eternal. Now I'll give you the last one and I close. He's sovereign. He's sovereign. I want to read this to you. Charles Hurry Haddon Spurgeon said this in regards to his sermon that he preached on Matthew 20, verse 15. Here's what he said. He said, It is not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things. Is it not lawful? for me to do what I wish with my own thing. There is no other more comforting, no, no attribute more comforting to his children than of God's sovereignty. Under the most severe trials, they believe that sovereignty has ordained their affliction, that sovereignty overrules them, and that sovereignty will sanctify them all. There is nothing for which the children ought more earnestly to contend than the doctrine of their master over all creation. The kingship of God over all the works of his hand, and the throne of God and his right to sit upon that throne. On the other hand, there is no doctrine more hated by whirlings, no truth of which they have more hated by whirlings, no truth by which made such a foot, football as a great, stupendous, but yet most certain doctrine of the sovereignty and the infinite Jehovah. This is where most people get upset. He said, men will allow God to be everywhere except on his throne. They will allow him to be in his workshop to fashion worlds and make stars. They will allow him to be in his alamar to dispense his alms and bestow his bounties. They will allow him to sustain the earth and bear up the pillars thereof, or light the lamps of heaven, or rule the waves of the ever-moving ocean. But when God ascends his throne, his creatures then gnash their teeth. And we proclaim and enthrone God in his right to do as he will with his own to dispose of his creatures as he thinks well, without consulting them in the matter. Then 
It is that we are hissed and exec execrated, and then it is that men turn a deaf ear to God, to us for God. On his throne is not God they love, but it is God upon his throne whom we trust. Now, the gist of what he's saying is this, and it's true. It is true. I had a conversation with the man online this week, and it was a good conversation. But when you begin to talk about the sovereignty of God, people have no problem with God being sovereign over the universe. They have no problem with that. They have no problem with his sovereignty in other areas. But the interesting thing to me is this, is that where people draw the line and they reject the sovereignty of God is when it comes to salvation. When it comes to salvation. You see, Jesus said that no man can come to me except the Father of what? Drops. The, the original word there is drag. Paul said in Romans that no man seeks after God. You read Romans chapter, he gives a whole list of things in that chapter. But you see, we ignore men, well, they want to ignore them. Because we want to think, and we want men to believe that we are the, the ruler of that decision. We make that decision. We can decide when we want to become Christian. We can decide when we want to come to God and when we don't want to come to God. But that's not how it works. And that's the reason that men despise the idea of sovereignty. That God is in control. Yes, God is in control of the universe. He's in control of time. He's in control of events. But he's also in control of those who come to him for salvation. Very much so. Now, let's move quickly. The psalmist wrote, Whoever the Lord pleases, whatever, whatsoever the Lord pleases, that did he in heaven and in earth and sea and all deep places. The God that the psalmist is writing about has not changed. Whatever he pleases to do, that's what he does. Amen? You and I can't thwart that. You and I can't stop it. You and I may object to it, but we can't do anything about it because he's, he's sovereign. He's sovereign. Sovereignty means that God possesses and exercises supreme authority in all of creation, including man. So God is in control of me, what I do or what I don't do. We think, as human men, sometimes we think that we, are, we, we control our own destiny. Remember the story of the rich man in the Gospel of Luke? His, his crops came in abundance. And the Bible says that he looked at all of his crops and he thought, what am I going to do? And here, here again is the picture of it, that he thought he was in control. And he said, I know what I'll do. I'll tear down my old barns and I'll build new barns and then I will live and be happy forever. And the Bible says, before he went to sleep that night, that God said, you fool. All these things now, who are they going to give to? He thought he controlled his own life. He could dictate what he would do and what he wouldn't do. And there's example after example where we see that God shows himself as being sovereign, being in control. Very much so. Now, I want to read you, and this is where I wanted to get anyway. I want to read you this, and then we'll close. I read this, and I heard this several months ago, and I forgot about it. And so last, yesterday, uh, I looked it up again. I want to show you an amazing story here. How many of you have ever read Isaiah chapter 10? Have you ever read it? I have. Okay. In Isaiah chapter 10, there's an amazing event that takes place. And I want you to see this. We're talking about the sovereignty of God. And in this, in this passage, you'll see a tremendous demonstration of what happens here. Let me begin to read it. Let's begin with verse 5. If you've got a Bible, turn there. because I want you to see this. Because you need to go down through this and read this and look at this, what he said. Isaiah chapter five, after chapter 10, verse 5. O Assyria, the rod of my anger and the staff in their hand is my indignation. I will send him against a hypocritical nation and against the people of my wrath. I will give him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Howbeit he meaneth not, so neither doth his heart think so. But it is in his heart to destroy and to cut off nations, not a few. For he said, Are not my princes altogether kings? Is not Colono and Carcinim 
Is it not, is not Hamath and Aphrod, is not Samaria and Damascus? As thy hand hath found the kingdom of the idols and worse, and whose graven images did excel them of Jerusalem and Samaria. I shall, I, I, shall I not as I have done unto Samaria and her idols, so do to Jerusalem and her idols. Wherefore it shall come to pass that when the Lord hath performed his whole work upon Mount Zion on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruits of the stout heart of the king of Assyria. Now, did you catch what happened here? God used the Assyrians to punish Israel. This is mind blowing. When he was done with them, he punished Assyria. Now, some people really objected to that, and I thought that was just really a mind blowing idea. But you say, that's unfair. Why did God do that? He used the Assyrians. He knew the Assyrians' heart. Though. That was the heart of the Assyrians anyway, to get rid of them, to destroy them. He used their desire to complete his purpose, mm -hmm. to punish Israel. And when he was finished with them, the Bible says he destroyed them. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Go home and read that. Contemplate on that. Look at what he says. Just try to, try to wrap your head around that thought. Can you imagine, although we don't, well, there's no way many times we can, can you imagine how many times that that no doubt happens in our lifetime? That God allows things to come about and then, bang, something changes? Well, we don't stop and think about it. Mm -hmm. We don't stop and think that, you know, this wasn't an accident, this wasn't a coincidence. It's God placing His hand in our lives and in our actions. Awesome. awesome. The song says, we serve a mighty God, an awesome God. The question is, can we wrap our head around this idea? Can we wrap our minds around this God? Can we understand that, that his, our purpose and our desire should be to honor and magnify and adore Him? Because, folks, the bottom line is our lives are in His hands. And the Bible says that he does whatsoever he pleases to do. No one dictates to him. No one stops him from doing what he's doing. He does whatever he so pleases. Now people find that to be, some people find that to be cruel. Some people think that's, that's awful and mean. God would be that way. But that's the God of the Bible. And we could go on and on and on with other characters because there are many other characteristics in the other God of the Bible. That we all need to know, we need to learn. Listen to the song. My God, how wonderful you are, your majesty, how bright, how beautiful your mercy, see, in depth the burning light. How wonderful, how beautiful the sight of you must be, your endless wisdom, boundless power, and glorious purity. Oh, how I fear you, living God, with deep and tender feet, and worship you with, with, turn, with trembling hope and pen, penitent tears. Yet I may love you too, O Lord Almighty, as you are, for you have stooped to ask of me the love of my poor heart. Let the fire hit the serve an awesome God. Yes. I trust that this will whet your thirst to want to know more about it. To want to learn more about it. Because you'll spend the rest of your life just trying to, to get even a touch the surface of what God is all about. Father, we thank you this morning for this opportunity. We thank you for Jack and his willingness to share his his podium with us. Lord, we pray that we've done and said those things which are pleasing and honoring to you. Lord, that we've spoke the truth. We ask, Lord, that, that people will take your word, not mine, and look at it and consider what it says about yourself. Lord, may we gain a deeper love and appreciation of you because of who you are, because of what you can do and what you have done. Pray for these folks that are here. Thank you for their attention, for their participation. Pray that you bless them, bless the church. 
Lord, we pray that you bring Brother Jack back safely. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.